Welcome everybody to our lecture about encrypted workflows on multi-user supercomputers. So this is originally prepared as part of the Computer Terra Colloquium series, but since we're doing the summer school this week, we decided to transition this into a summer school event. Uh, but what you will see is that this is more like a colloquium lecture in the sense that there's no real exercise. However, there is a demonstration that you can follow along. And the is on the website. So yeah, the in terms of prerequisites, there's not much. I do hope uh, most of you are already familiar with at least the basics of supercomputers. So how to log in and how to submit jobs, the difference between a login node and a compute node. And yeah, so in terms of knowledge about encryption, uh, nothing is really needed. This could be considered somewhat as a follow-up to Yarno's lecture on Monday, which was more broadly about data security. But if you if you participate in that, so great. But if not, then it's also okay. So let's start. And we start by considering the privacy on multi-user Linux systems. So imagine we have a file, creditcardinfo.txt, and that file has some secret information, very confidential, but for some reason I decide to upload that to one of our supercomputers, let's say Niagara in this case, and I, I would use the SCP utility from my own workstation, and upload it like so. So after that, this file exists in my home directory on Niagara. So who exactly has access to the file? So first and foremost, anybody with Unix permissions. So Unix or Linux has its own built-in permission system in which each file has a read, write, and execute permissions. And those permissions can be applied to the owner, a group, and anybody else in the system. So by default, when you upload a file to Niagara or create a new file in your home directory, the owner, which is you, will have read and write permission, the group will have read permission, and nobody else would have any permissions. And as the owner, you can also change those permissions. Beyond that, on the file system level, we have the access control list, which is pretty similar, but much more fine grained. So you can give any particular user on the system read or write access beyond what the Unix permissions are. By default, the ACL would be empty, but of course you can change you can change it uh, on a per file basis. What you cannot change is the fact that the system administrators or the root user on Linux can view and modify any file on the system. And regardless of the permission system, anybody that has physical access to the drives where the data are stored could potentially retrieve the data. So let me give you an example. If the if a drive from the storage system malfunctions and it's discarded improperly, or when the storage system entirely is retired and somebody gets access to those drives, in principle, they can retrieve this file that, that was there. It's not as easy because the layout on the file system can be quite complex, but in principle, it's possible. And the same applies for the backup system. So on Niagara, things from your home folder and from the project folder are backed up. And they're backed up, in fact, in multiple copies. And if somebody has access to those backups, then they can um, look, look into your file, again, regardless of the, what the permissions are. So encryption in a nutshell, many parties may access the file, 
but without knowledge of the cipher and the key, all they can see is gibberish. So when we're doing encryption, we don't care so much about managing access to the file, but we care about managing access to the content. So something that Yarno probably showed in his lecture as well is how encryption looks like. So just imagine that you start with um, some humanly readable file. Of course, it can also be numerical data. This is what we call the plain text. And the ciphertext is the encrypted version. Is In this case, it's just a sequence of randomly looking numbers and digits and some other signs. In this case, the ciphertext is encoded in some way that is possible to view it on the screen. But more generally, it would be binary data, so not really printable. There are many encryption algorithms, which are ciphers, or cipher is the, is the name for an encrypt, encryption algorithm. And a cipher is, is just a function of the plain text and the key. And later, I'll tell you a little bit more about what ciphers are available, what categories of ciphers are available. But first, I'd like to talk more about the practicality of encrypting on supercomputers. So if you can have hardware-based encryption, that is definitely the best. So in this case, the CPU and the system memory are not involved in the cryptography, which improves security and performance. And in this category, we have the hardware security module, or HSM, and self-encrypting drive. So those two things are quite similar. The HSM is a much more powerful device, and it's really meant for comp company data centers, not really accessible uh, for the general public, and not really available in, um, for academic data centers. But self-encrypting drives are more like a commodity product that you can buy and just install it in your laptop or desktop. What those devices do is they have special electronics that takes care of the encryption for you. So you don't really have to do anything. This is done by, by this hardware. And since the, the key doesn't go through the CPU or the system memory, that improves security. But as I said, sometimes this is not available for you. And the next best thing is software-based encryption. So in this category, the most common way to use software-based encryption is with file system encryption. And probably you already are using it. So if you have a modern phone, then in the, previous, in, in the past few years, by default, it, it encrypts at least part of the file system. And you should probably also be using it on your own uh, workstation as well. When you have file system encryption, then the software access files normally, but they're encrypted on the disk. So it's very similar to how hardware-based encryption behaves in the sense that it is transparent to the user and the, and the software. So what, what you have is a layer between the actual storage and the user space where the software runs. And in this case, this is a software layer. So it's part of the operating system, usually, or a driver. You also have encryption programs. So again, Yarno discussed that on Monday. So th these are used to encrypt individual files, for example. So you can send them around uh, or establish secure network connection. So for example, your browser, when you go to an HTTPS address, acts as an encryption software because it encrypts the traffic back and forth. Yeah, and uh, email as well. So if you use encrypted emails, your email client acts as an encryption program. And finally, you have cryptographic libraries, which are uh, more sort of uh, professional solution. So if you need your code, your actual program to perform the encryption, 
then you can use those libraries. And uh, you probably don't want to do that unless your research is specifically about cryptography, but um, there are some use cases uh, and it's definitely important. But as mentioned, file system encryption is the most common thing. And moreover, this is what I'm going to show you in the demonstration later today. So let's get back to the ciphers and talk about what kind of ciphers exist. So there are broadly two categories. So symmetric encryption and asymmetric encryption. So symmetric encryption is probably the more common one. And the reason it's called symmetric is because the decryption is done with the same key that is used for the encryption. It's based on bit scrambling. So taking the ones and zeros from the original message or plain text and just putting them in a different order while mixing in the key such that it's impossible to reverse unless you also know the key. There are a few mechanisms to do that. So substitution permutation networks is one that's used in block ciphers. That's uh, probably the more common one. Uh, SP networks are just sequence of steps that tell you exactly how to do this bit scrambling and key mixing. And then you have a different category of pseudorandom functions that are used in what's called stream ciphers that basically those are functions that create a stream of pseudorandom numbers which are which statistically behave like real random numbers and this is a virtually infinite stream and then those numbers the, those pseudo random numbers are used like a one one time pad so basically like a lookup table to encrypt the message so this bit scrambling is generally considered fast so that is why those algorithms are, are relatively popular and a popular example probably the most common encryption algorithm that is used in the world right now is AES, Advanced Encryption Standard, also called Reindel. And the reason that it's the most common one is because HTTPS traffic mostly uses AES under the hood. So um, usages, uh, as I said, secure networking. However, secure networking needs another very, very important component, which is a key exchange algorithm. So as I mentioned, since symmetric key uses the same key for encryption and decryption, you do need some mechanism to distribute the key between the two parties. And this is an algorithm, like there are several ways to do that, but it's a little bit beyond uh, symmetric encryption. And also importantly, uh, encryption at rest, which is what we're going to do today. We're going to upload files to Niagara and make sure that they're encrypted and not at rest. So asymmetric encryption is named so because it uses a different key for encryption and decryption. And you probably have already heard the terms private and public key because in, the, in those kind of schemes, one of those two keys you will keep to yourself and the other one you would publicize for everybody. And what's going on under the hood in these methods is one-way functions. So functions that are fairly easy to calculate one way, but are extremely difficult and computationally impossible to reverse. If you know the output, you cannot figure out what the input was. The most famous mechanism for that is prime factorization. You probably have heard of that. Here, if you have two very large prime numbers and you multiply them to get a much larger semi-prime number, then if you have the, just the semi-prime number, you, don't, you can't easily or at all factorize it back to those original prime numbers. But just the multiplication is fairly easy. And there are other mechanisms like elliptic curves and the discrete logarithm problem that have a similar idea one way functions. So while, as I said, 
one-way functions are fairly easy to calculate one way, those they still require some relatively complex math that is slow, especially compared to this bit scrambling. So asymmetric encryption is generally much slower than symmetric encryption. And popular example, again, you may be familiar with RSA, the Rivers Shamir Adler method, that is popular because uh, SSH um, SSH keys are often uh, RSA key. And usage usages, so public key cryptography. So if you want to encrypt a message to somebody and you know the public key, you can you can safely encrypt it and send it around even in unsecured channels and only they will be able to decrypt it with their private key. That's what's called public key cryptography. There are some other usages, for example, authentication, digital signatures, so key exchange. So uh, one way to, to do key exchanges using asymmetric encryption. And for example, the SSH protocol uses RSA or other asymmetric methods for uh, for, for the purpose of, of key exchange. And cryptocurrencies as well. So the idea of digital signatures is quite important um, when, when signing um, transactions in a ledger. Okay, so let's stop for a second and see if anybody has any question. So please put it in the chat. Okay, I see nothing. So let's continue. Right, so encryption is necessary, but not sufficient for data security. So in this lecture, I'm not gonna focus on data security more broadly. Again, uh, go watch Jarno's talk if you wanna know more about that. But let's talk a little bit about when encryption gets broken and why. So first, the statement that state-of-the-art ciphers are unbreakable as of 2023. Vulnerabilities may come from using obsolete ciphers. So ciphers that were considered secure even 10 years ago might not be anymore. So some vulnerabilities have been discovered and generally, they're, they can only be exploited by extremely well-funded or state-sponsored attackers. But just be aware that there's no reason to use older ciphers. But even if you are using a state-of-the-art cipher, if the implementation is not correct, for example, if it has a weak random number or a prime generator, then there could be the, the, the scheme could be vulnerable, uh, especially if the prime numbers that are used in RSA, for example, are not far enough, then there are very fast algorithms that can crack it. So that's very important. Uh, don't try to implement encryption by yourself unless you really, really know what you're doing. Those things are quite sensitive. So even if the, you're using a state-of-the-art cipher and you have a strong implementation, still the weakest link might be a password. So if the encryption key or symmetric encryption is derived from a password, then, the, then it could be, um, if, if the password is not very good, then the encryption is not very good. And looking for uh, and trying to crack easy passwords is, known to be very easy. And now we have human error. So if the keys are improperly stored or if the password are improperly stored, for example, sent in an email, that, that is pretty bad. If, if, you are, if you have a very secure workflow, but accidentally you send your data to an insecure location, then again, you leaked sensitive information. 
And finally, falling victims to phishing or social engineering, which means that accidentally revealing your credentials to somebody. That's also unfortunately a possibility. And finally, we have the possibility of the endpoint being compromised. So the workstation that you're using to connect to your secure system is compromised, has a virus or Trojan or something, then an attacker could potentially discover your password or something just by just from the keystrokes. So be aware of that and you know try to mitigate, but again, this is not really the subject for today. Yeah, so this asterisk here regarding the unbreakability of, of uh, state-of-the-art ciphers. So in the future, quantum computers may be able to break current popular key exchange and asymmetric encryption algorithms. Post-quantum crypt cryptography is being studied for standardization. So post-quantum in, in this case doesn't really mean anything that uses some science fiction physics or anything. Those are just mathematical problems, so one-way functions that don't have any known way to reverse them using quantum computing. And in several years, we will probably use uh, some of those algorithms like uh, lattice encryption, and regardless of whether quantum computing will eventually break modern day uh, RSA or not. So computing on encrypted data. If the data are encrypted at rest, they have to be decrypted before they can be computed on, right? This seems like a no-brainer. Anybody wants to chime in the chat, say yes or no? It's fairly early in the morning, so yes, most people are still asleep. Okay, so Ian says yes. Okay, and let, so let me give you the answer. The answer is surprisingly no. So, so the reason for saying no, it's, it's a little bit theoretical, but it's called homomorphic encryption. So homomorphic encryption is a set of techniques that allow you to perform computations and theoretically any computation on encrypted data without decrypting them first. So the math behind this is very complex and I don't pretend to really understand that, but I can give you a taste of what homomorphic encryption is like by looking at RSA, which is already mentioned before, is a very popular encryption algorithm and it's used for asymmetric encryption, but it is also partially homomorphic cryptosystem. So if we have two cipher texts, A bar and B bar, their multiplication, A bar dot B bar, happens to equal A dot B bar. So if you want to just multiply several numbers, you don't have to supply your calculator or your calculation program with the actual numbers you're multiplying, but you can supply it with, the, with your cipher texts, A bar and B bar, and whatever other numbers you want to multiply, and do the calculation, get the result, and then you can decrypt the result. So the software was never aware of what numbers it was multiplying. So that might not be too useful. You know, multiplying numbers is not... Uh, you know, maybe a little bit of a specific operation, but fully homomorphic encryption is kind of arbitrary. So it, and any operation can be can be done theoretically again. And how it works is by on, on Boolean logic. So A and B would can only be true or false, and then you you construct and you can construct boolean circuits and you can create arbitrary operations from from those circuits yeah so unfortunately though fully homomorphic encryption is not practical for general purpose computations as of 2023 you can try to use some homomorphic cryptography 
libraries and but you will have to really you know do it yourself and like and and put in like co incorporate this in, in your program so this is really for very specific use cases as of today so circling back to the original question the answer is yes in order to compute on encrypted data practically they have to be decrypted first and that's what we're gonna see later so in, in this slide there is a little bit more details about how rsa works and and how come it's homomorphic with respect to multiplication at least i don't want to really get into it too much so just just very briefly this is how this is what rsa looks like we have an encryption function which is just the message in some power mod n so e n and d are some numbers they are chosen very very carefully and the entire magic of rsa which is really a genius algorithm is how to choose those e n and d so e is used for encryption and d is used for decryption and if you just write a bar dot b bar and you write them explicitly using those expressions you can see that at least in the ring modulo n the, the statement that i made earlier is correct so the system is homomorphic with respect to multiplication and again this might not be super useful but it gives you a, a, some sort of glimpse of what fully homomorphic encryption might be like so as we agreed there's no way around actually decrypting data when we want to calculate on them so what are the implications so the decryption key and the plain text data exist at least temporarily in the system memory it is technically possible for the root user to retrieve these so you do a memory dump and see what's in the memory even if it's um, if, even if the user already user's job already completed so this requires some targeted effort and specialized skills though so normal sysadmins would not go and snoop around and even if they do the nor the file system encryption methods that we're talking about will obfuscate the the password or, or keys uh, quite effectively another security implication is that in multi-node applications the plain text data may be transmitted over the na network which means unencrypted data is transmitted over the network which makes it somewhat susceptible to many in the middle attacks and finally if a swap partition exists the plain text data may be saved there so in supercomputing we don't usually have swap partitions um, but just be aware of it more generally they would exist so a swap partition can always be disabled and there are actually ways to encrypt the swap partition as well so those are the security implications however there's also importantly performance degradation at least to some extent if you're using encryption because now the cpu is busy trying to encrypt or decrypt the data and so some of the computing power goes there so here i did a single thread io test on the niagara gpfs scratch and r clone encryption so R clone is the program that we're going to use later. So I will explain about it in more detail soon. But for, for now, just think about, about it as one um, software encryption solution. And as you can see, the read speed is twice as slow, more or less, when you're using an encrypted file system. And the write speed is as much as four times as slow so be aware of that uh, that the, this these values are should be taken with somewhat 
of a grain of salt because it depends on you know the load of, of the storage system and also other parameters like the the encrypted write operations um, are cached and then depends on, on some parameters of the cache but generally you would see a slowdown um, in for our clone it's, it's two or four times as slow but uh, there are in fact other solutions that uh, are are faster so our clone might not be uh, implemented in the best way yeah so that's something that you should be aware of okay so soon we'll start talking about the workflow itself and just so you know you can follow along in the course website can you see my second window so i'll start with a disclaimer so this presentation is for demonstration purposes only. Make sure to fully understand the workflow before copying sensitive information to Niagara or any of, of the other clusters and consult your institution's ethics board regarding data privacy requirements. So also in the, um, in, in the workflow on the website, I copied from the Dig Digital Research Alliance of Canada's terms of use and um, so the paragraph there also tells you that uh, you are responsible to understanding and meeting uh, your data privacy requirements. So just be aware of that. Uh, you are, of course, welcome to learn from this, but again, uh, it's your responsibility. However, members of the University of Toronto community, including the affiliated hospitals, may be able to participate in the Signage for Health pilot project. And in this pilot project, we will take on the burden of the responsibility of, of your data privacy. So we would use our encryption, so our own encryption, and you would just be using it uh, as is. So if you're interested, please contact us for more details. And with that out of the way, we'll start the demonstration. It has two parts. So the first part is just storing secret files on the cluster. And the second part, which is significantly more complicated, is using the encrypted data in actual computations. OK, so with finally, uh, with this solved, the zero step of this process would be to install our clone on your workstation. So I already briefly mentioned our clone. So let's uh, discuss a little bit more about what our clone is. It's a command line program to manage data transfer to different storage systems. While SCP and rsync utilities are very useful for transferring files between Unix like systems, our clone supports multiple cloud storage products such as Google Drive, Microsoft OneDrive, and Amazon S3. Or AWS. While not specifically meant for encryption, our clone is nevertheless quite useful in this regard. It can be used to store files remotely encrypted such that the cloud provider or the HPC operator has no access to the private content. So while this demonstration uses our clone, alternatives include GoCryptFS, QuietFS, and SecureFS, and the logic to using them would be quite similar. I'm just using our clone because that's what I already know. So the zero step would be installing on the workstation. And again, workstation means whatever is your computer, desktop, laptop, or tablet. So you can go to this link and find the version that's compatible with your operating system and CPU architecture. And you can also install it from a package manager or build it yourself from source code. It's open source software. We won't be using it otherwise. So yeah, and what we're gonna assume from now is that it's installed on, on the workstation. So the first real step is setting up Niagara as an SFTP remote. So what is a remote? In the Arclon context, a remote is a set of configurations that tell our clone how to access a specific storage system. Each remote has a type, which could be, for example, Microsoft OneDrive, SFTP, or local drive, local directory. 
So specifically SFTP remote is any remote system which can be accessed by the user through SSH. So how to set it up? What I'm going to show you assumes that you have that you already have a way to access Niagara with an SSH key and controversially that it has no passphrase or MFA set up for your login process. So these extra protections are of course highly recommended and they don't impede our clone but they involve a few more configuration steps. So for simplicity we'll just assume that, that you don't have these. So the way to set up the remote is to type this command. So Arclon config create tells us to create a remote. Niagara would be the name of the remote. SFTP would be the type of the remote. And then the, the parameters to connect. So the host name, the username, so your CCDB username, the key file, which is your secret or your private key for uh, the SSH connection. And uh, strangely, ask password has to be equals true. This is a bit of a quirk of Niagara because how it is set up for uh, multi-factor authentication. So we will be asked for a password, despite the fact that there is no password and the key has no passphrase. And we just put in anything. So any string, like just a number one, that, that would work. So after we set it up, we will we can check that it worked by issuing this command, rclone lsf, which stands for list files, Niagara colon, which tells us that this is the name of the remote. So let's see this uh, in the demonstration. So first I wanna show you the file that, the secret file that we want to work on. So this is experiments.dat, this is highly secret information that I want to calculate using. So the calculation that we want to do is just sum up the gold mass in this fourth column. And to do this, I have the script that uh, I hope you can see. It's just a very simple Python program that uses pandas to, to do this um, um, column, the, the, the sum. And of course, this is very easy. I could do this on my workstation as well, but the point here is to show you how to do this on Niagara. So now let's set up the remote as I explained by just typing this command. And so the, the output is just the sort of just a formatting of what we saw. This is the entry that's going to go into the um, rclone configuration file. And next we're typing rclone lsf niagara. Now we're being asked for a password. Again, because there's no password, I'm just putting in the number one. And the result is the content of my home directory, which as you can see, is this analysis.py file that we just showed you which is what we're gonna use. Right, so back to the workflow. The next step, number two, is creating an empty directory on Niagara. At this stage, all we want to do is just create some place where we can store our encrypted files. And when we access this directory normally by the shell command on, on Niagara, it will appear to contain to contain just unusable garbage. So what we would do is just uh, make a directory. So this is um, very simple. Notice that I will put our encrypted directory under Scratch. Uh, and since I'm using the Scratch environment variable, I also need to be aware of the full path. So if we type echo uh, .scratch, we will see what the full path is. And we just need to make note of it because we will need it at a later stage. So uh, let's connect to Niagara and, oops, sorry. Let's connect to Niagara and create a directory. Okay. 
after this is done. The next step is to set up a crypt remote on the workstation. A crypt remote is another type of remote that wraps another remote to provide an encryption layer. The, crypto the cryptography is done entirely by the Arclan program. So this can be used with virtually all the storage backends. So you can use it to encrypt, thing, encrypt your backup in the cloud, for example. So each crypt remote uses a single password and the actual encryption key is derived from the password. So that circles back to what I said earlier, that if you want your encryption to be good, then your password has to be very good as well. So the file names may or may not be encrypted depending on your choice. And there's some, there's some metadata like the file size and modification date that are also not encrypted or, or easily uh, identified. So in this step, we're going back to the workstation and setting up this crypt remote and how to set it up using again the same command so artron config create now the name of our remote will be secrets the type would be crypt and now we have those additional parameters so remote what is the original remote which is niagara and the path within niagara which is the directory that we just created and you need to specify the full path and finally, the password. So this is our password. So I'm putting in the password as part of the command line here. Uh, this is generally not a good idea, but we assume that the workstation is a secure machine. And also our secret file is accessible to the user. So also the history, the command history, is protected, so that is fine if, if the uh, password is stored in this case. Later, we will see how to avoid this. So let's get back to the workstation and create the remote. OK. So now we get, um, again, the whatever is going to go into the artron.conf and the password you should know is stored in the artron.conf so it is not in fact encrypted so if you open up the artron.conf you you will not see the password that we just put in this uh what is it like 3mk blah 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 uh, but it will be obfuscated but only slightly obfuscated so so this is not considered a, a secure storage of the password Okay, the next step is copying a secret file to the uh, to the encrypted storage. And we just do it using the artron copy command. And importantly, we are specifying the secrets remote here. If I specify Niagara column here, it would go just to Niagara. So be very careful that you indeed copy into the correct remote. So let's do that. Again, I'm asked for the password, which is just any string, and that worked. And now what we're going to do is we're going to circle back to Niagara and inspect the content of this encrypted folder. So you see now when I list the content, this directory that we just created, so it was empty, now has a file and the file has this weird name. So the file we copied was called experiments.dat, but this has some garbled name. And I can also look at the content. And since I know it's a binary file, I can use the uh, hex dump command. So as you can see, there's nothing really useful here. Okay, so this sums up the first part of this demonstration. So in fact, this is a milestone 
we put in a file in encrypted storage. So now it's it, if it's you know if it's in your project folder or something or archive, you can um, you can be sure that that it's secure. Any questions so far? Okay, I'm gonna continue. So at this point, our precious data are encrypted at trust on Niagara. And perhaps that's all we needed. But if you actually want to make use of the computing power, the compute nodes have to be able to decrypt the data. So as we discussed, this does introduce some new risks. So unlike the workstation, we do not assume that the cluster or its file system are secure. So now we'll make sure that the encryption password is not saved anywhere in plain text. That will complicate things significantly, but otherwise having the en encrypted encryption password saved along uh, the encrypted data really defeats the purpose of this whole endeavor. So the first step would be to install our clone on Niagara. So usually we provide software as modules on Niagara, but not our clone. However, this is very easy to install in your home directory. So I'm not going to explain those commands. Just, you can just copy and paste them. So let's do that. Right, so uh, as you can see, the last command that I put was just appending this to my dot bash RC. So since we want the Arclone command to be available in every session, we need this, uh, we need the path to be, we need this path to be added in every session. So we added it to the bash RC. Uh, of course, you can just open it in the text editor and add this line, uh, yeah, but that works as well. Right, so the next step is encrypting the configurations. And since the configuration file, as I mentioned before, has the encryption password, it has to be encrypted on the, on the Niagara file system. We use Arclone Interactive Configuration Interface, which you can launch with the Arclone config command without any additional parameters. And you will just get an interactive menu there and you can uh, select S for setting configuration password, or by A to add a password, and then you would enter the configuration password twice. So for the purpose of this demonstration, we use this as a configuration password. And note that this is different to the encryption password that we used before. So let's do that. Right, so now we can also have a look at the configuration file itself and see how it looks like. And as you can see, there is some garbled text here and that is basically the, shows us the, that the configuration is encrypted. Right, next, we want to create a crypt remote again this time on Niagara rather than our workstation. So unlike before, we don't want the we want, don't want to put the password in the shell command. Again, I already mentioned that the shell command history is stored on the file system and it's also backed up. So the, this would pretty much uh, ruin the, the security posture. So uh, we do this again using the Arclone config uh, interface. And the now it's going to be a little bit more to go through. So I'm just going to uh, let the video play so you see uh, what, what you should press. So, but, but eventually it will set up the secrets remote the same way as what was in on the workstation. 
So let's see. So yeah, now I typed Arclone config. And the first thing that happens is that I'm interactively asked for the configuration password that we just created in the previous step. Yeah, so creating a new remote, the type of decrypt. Now I, this is the full path of the of the of the encrypted directory. I have some other options. And now I'm putting in the actual encryption password, and I will be asked for this twice. Remember, this is different from the configuration password. Right, so that, that has worked. So now we're on Niagara. We can inspect the encrypted directory in plain text using the Arclone commands that we already saw before. So we already saw Arclone LSF. And now every time we interact with our clone, we have to put in our configuration password, not the, not the encryption password, but the configuration password. So LSF, now we see that the file name is shown in plain text, so ex experiment said that. And we can also inspect the content using the our clone cap command. And again, putting in the configuration password. And as you can see, this is what I showed you in the beginning of the workstation. Okay, let's go on. So mount points. So mounting means making the plain text content of our encrypted directory accessible in a virtual file system within the Linux file system hierarchy. First, we create the mount point using just make dir, and uh, now the, the name would be decrypted again under scratch. So the, the rest of this text here just tells you that later we will use Arclone mount to, to perform this mounting, but I will show it more in the next step. So let's see that. Okay, basically, that's it. Just creating the directory. We were already on Scratch, so there's no need to, uh, to specify this, but we get the point. Okay, so the next step is probably the longest and most complicated, which is the job script and how to actually submit the job. So in order to mount the encrypted directory, we need to provide our clone with a configuration password. So again, every time we interact with our clone now, since the configuration is encrypted, we need to provide encryption password. So how can we do this safely? There are several ways, and there is a trade-off between security and convenience. We'll assume that the jobs are single node. Multi-node jobs can access encrypted storage in a similar way, but there are complications and they actually have to be solved on a case-by-case -case basis. So for simplicity, just single node jobs. And there is some um, comment here about um, the fact that on Niagara, we use full nodes, we schedule by full nodes, and on some other clusters that not, might not be the case. But if you're mounting encrypted storage, for security reasons, you would probably rather use the whole node. So whichever cluster you're using, better to use a full node. So the first method of doing it is just putting in the password inside the job script. So in this method, we just set the rclone config pass environment variable to the password inside the job script. So this is the easiest but least secure way since the password is saved on disk. And furthermore, environment variables can easily be viewed by root. And while root again can always uh, find your key, we don't want to make it easy. So um, yeah, so it is just the configuration password uh, that is saved in plain text and not the encryption password. So also be aware of that. It's maybe not as bad as it originally sounds. So while this should not be the preferred method, it is useful to demonstrate how the virtual file system is mounted and later we will try to do better. So here is an example job script. And again, I'm kind of assuming that you've already seen something like that before, so you know how to submit a job. So in the beginning, we have some 
uh, as batch commands. And here we have conveniently uh, several blocks that do different things. So the first block is the mounting of the file system. And it's a little bit convoluted, but um, it's not really complicated. First, as I, as I mentioned, we set up the Arclone config pass environment variable to our password. Uh, then we do an unmount step. I will get to, to that at the end, actually. Here we're setting up some environment variables that are related to how our clone writes into the encrypted storage. And this is the mounting command itself. The ampersand tells, that tells us that the our clone mount command has to go to the background. And then we add some sleep. The reason is that if we start write, reading or writing to the encrypted storage before the mounting has been uh, completed, then um, it, it will just fail. So the, usually five seconds is enough for this to, to complete. So then we just load some modules and execute our command, which is Python analysis.py. Now the input is experiments.dat, just a normal file name, and it's located within the decrypted folder. Remember, this was just an empty folder that we created as a mount point, and here we actually mounted it. So Python, so your, your script, will just see this as a regular file. It has no idea that it's that it's coming from encrypted storage. And also we redirect the output to another file called output in the same directory. So it will also be written as an encrypted file. Right, and the final block is sort of like trying to gracefully unmount the file system. So this, this tells our clone to flush the cache and we want to sleep a little bit before we uh, perform this unmount step. And here we just clean up uh, some residuals from the cache. So if your job, if, if your Python script either times out or crashes due to um, um, memory issues, then maybe the, the last block will actually not get, uh, get executed, which is also fine because then the Slurm epilog will do the cleanup for you with the exception that the mount point, this directory, might be left in a bad state. And if this happens, then you can use this command to make sure that it is really unmounted before you try to mount it again. Otherwise, it might fail. OK, so let's do that. And let's show you how it looks like. So just creating a file, typing in the content that I just showed you. emphasizing that the password is saved in the script. And now to submit the job, we just s batch the name of the file. And we get plenty of warnings here. And the reason is that I'm only using a single core and on Mago, you're not supposed to do that. And also maybe I'm uh, using, and the job might be running for too short a time. But anyway. It's, it's just because of this demonstration. So if I'm checking the status of the job, I see that it's completed. And now we can go back to the workstation and use the Arclone commands from before to, for example, inspect the content of the encrypted directory. And now you can see we have the new output file in, additional, in addition to experiments like that. And uh, can also uh, copy it with Arclon copy. And now it's on our workstation. And we can inspect, and this is indeed what we uh, is expected. Good. So that is the uh, 
th that is the bulk of what we needed to learn. So now we want to improve this process a little bit. So we don't have to put in the password in the job script, which as I said, was a bad idea. So in the second method, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put in the password manually, which is a little bit of an issue because the job runs on some compute node and we don't know when it's actually gonna start. So how do we do that? First of all, we want to add uh, this line over here that uses the Swarm mail um, feature to send us a mail when, when the job begins. You can also use all to get more fine-grained information like when the job ends or if it fails or et cetera. And now we are setting up uh, a Unix named pi or FIFO. So it's just, it, it looks like a file, but in fact, it's used for inter-process communication on Unix systems. So it's created with this command like FIFO. And what the, uh, and instead of having the rclone password saved in a file, uh, saved in an environment variable, we are now using this environment variable, rclone password command. And uh, the command is just cat pipe. So whatever this, this pipe is, it's going to be um, show, uh, shown in, in STD out. Uh, yeah, so again, the uh, unmounting step and the cache parameters uh, are the same. Uh, but now we added another command here that tells the script to basically hang as long as we're waiting for the pipe. So what's going to happen is that once you issue this command, cat pipe, then the, the command, the rclone uh, mount command, just going to hang. But the script, because it's going to the background, the script will just continue. So we need to add this. So the script itself waits until the, the connection is terminated. So yeah, and then we just remove the pipe. So somehow we will need to uh, go on the compute node and connect to that pipe that we created and put in the password. So how do you do that? We do that by you know, patiently waiting for us to get an email. And when we get the email, we can look, we can use the Slurm commands to see what node we are running on, then connect to it via SSH, and then type in this command. So this command um, is a little bit convoluted, but what, what it does is it, it, it prompts you for a password. It puts the password in an environment variable and then it sends the environment variable to the, to the pipe. So let's see how this is done. So I'm just copying the previous file into a new name. And now let's do some editing. Okay, so now we submit the job. And we see that we already got an email. Now, remember, this email might have come in the middle of the night. We don't know uh, when the job actually starts. And we see that the job is indeed running on node Naya0924. So now what we need to do is to SSH into this node and put in this command that will um, uh, send the password to the pipe. Okay, remember I'm putting in the configuration password, not the encryption password. Yeah, so once you do this, the job terminates and we can see that it finished successfully. And um, yeah, that's it. Right, so there is another 
option, which is a somewhat better compromise between uh, putting the password manually and putting it in the job script, but it might take maybe a little bit more than the time we have to, to show it. And I do want to finish in time. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to record this five, 10 minutes and, and put this on the course website. Hi again. So now I'm going to talk about the third method, which is using a key server. So this method is a somewhat better compromise between security and convenience. Here, the configuration password is held by the key management server, and a token is used to retrieve the password. The token is saved in plain text on disk, but it's of an ephemeral nature. If the key server is outside the data center, a possible attacker will not be able to modify the logs, and the breach could be discovered in an audit of the password requests. For simplicity, we will use a key server running on a login node, otherwise some tunnel link has to be involved. The program we're going to use is called S5. It's a lightweight program with server and client components. It is designed to be used in an HPC environment where a login node and a compute node share a file system. The source code and a more detailed description are found here on GitHub. It's installed on Niagara as a module, but it's also easy to install in a Python virtual environment as well. So to start the server, you would, on the login node, load the module first, and then type S5 server. The program will ask for a secret, which in our case will be the configuration password, and we'll enter the configuration password. And the program will output the first six digits of the secrets SHA-256 hash, and that will help us make sure that we didn't make any mistake. And to retrieve the password, the client would issue the S5 client command, and since they share the file system, the, the client will know where to find the token, transmit it to the server, and then the password will be transmitted to the client. And also, um, the, it's configured such that once a valid request is made, the server sends the password and shuts itself down. So the job script looks like this now. Uh, the job has to be submitted after the S5 server has started, because unlike the previous method, the job does not wait for the server and it fails if it cannot connect. So let's copy the first file, the password in file uh, job script, into an, and, uh, and edit that. So first I want to move the modules up. So I first load the S5 module, and then the S5 client command would be available. And that's it. So now we need to launch the key server first. We're putting in the configuration password. And as you can see, it's reporting that the server is running and it's telling us on which host it's listening and on which port. And this information is already saved on the file system. So the S5 client, when it tries to connect, it will know where to, where to go. So finally, we just submit the job, and that's it. So it should work as expected.